All right, quick audio check. Much success. Let's get this show on the road. Welcome to Mask at IETF 118. This is Friday session one, as you may have noticed from the sparseness of the people in the hallway. Uh, as always, this session is being recorded for ITF hybrid meetings. Uh, make sure that if you're in the room, you've scanned the QR code to join with the on-site tool and then enter the queue by pressing the Q button. Um, if you're remote, do the same thing, but also you have buttons for audio and video since you're not there physically in the room. This is the IETF Notewell. It's Friday, so you should have seen this before, but if not, make sure to take some time to actually read it all the way through. These are the terms under which we participate in the IETF. And this working group, as with the rest of the ITF, also operates under a code of conduct. So please be respectful and treat each other well. Um, you can come to the chairs, the AD, or the OMSBUD team at any time with any concerns. We've got some helpful links here, and you'll notice there is a uh, difference in this slide from normal. We now have a third chair joining us. Um, welcome, Dennis. And we also have a chair sadly leaving us, uh, which is Chris. Um, Chris has done a huge amount to help Mass go, uh, getting it off the ground in the very beginning with a bunch of the uh, early charter discussions and all the way through with, with all of the documents that we've published so far. Um, so uh, I know David also wanted to uh, say a few things before we all clap for Chris. Man, way to ruin my surprise. Um, Hi everyone, David Skenazi, OG mask enthusiast. Um, so when we started this party um, in March of 2020, um, we were all planning for this buff and actually a bit before then, um, my good friend Chris stepped up and decided to be one of the buff chairs. And so we'd spend some time and we're gonna have this great meeting in Vancouver. Um, then, there's some, something on the news happened in February of 2020. I don't really remember what, but then uh, then we got stuck at home. And well, I, I won't give you the long version because it's really long, but Chris was there through all of that, like really helped us and patiently watched as we figured out how many variants did we need at the beginning of the datagram frame and such fascinating topics um, and really got us to where we are today with the three main documents published. Um, that took a lot of work and it was really nice of him. So I know he just boarded his flight, so he's not listening, but uh, thank you, Chris. And if, I, if anyone feels that this is a good assessment, please join me in clapping for Chris. And while we're at it, welcome to the party, Dennis. Can I have a round of clap for Dennis? Because he's going to do a lot of work, too. <laughs> Thanks, David. And Eric, you're fine. You'll get claps later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the spirit. Love it. Um, we got some claps in the chat, too. Thank you all for that. Uh, very much welcome, Dennis. Um, feel free to uh, come and, and chat with both and, and either of us. Um, we're going to be, be bringing him up to speed as, as we go. Um, especially as we get, dig deep into the next phase of fun mask excitement, or should I say enthusiasm. All right, this is our uh, agenda for today. We've got uh, three slash two um, currently adopted documents for extensions, and then we have what is less of an extension and, and more of a, a main document for proxying Ethernet, uh, which we will talk about at the end there. Uh, before we get too far into that, though, uh, I wanted to call everyone's attention um, to the fact that we have previously published two of our core documents, and that has now been recently joined by a third core document. So while we're in the mood for clapping, let's do one more round of applause for all the work that all of us have put in to making this go. All right. With that, back to our agenda. The first thing up is Tommy with QuickAware Proxying using HTTP. Uh, 
Uh, I'm sorry, Eric. Uh, agenda bash. Um, were we going to do the loop thing before quick proxy? Before he talked about solutions? That is a very good point. OK, so shall I approach the mic? <laughs> well, up to, up to so, Tommy, do you want to do that before or after? I, I think, so I, I saw your slides. I think the loop stuff is somewhat orthogonal. So like the, okay. the presentation here is just about like the design team's thoughts on encryption and attack oh, models. Excellent. Okay. So I think there are two separate topics on the same topic. Okay. I don't think they're All right. ordered. That's fine, whatever you think. Let, let's insert that after after this, but before listener then. So, all right, take us away, Tommy. I think I granted slides, but I can turn off mine if that gets in the way. Yeah, I'd like to be able to choose the slide deck. Here we go. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Tommy Polly from Apple, and I'm going to be presenting a slide deck that was built by committee, which is the best way to make slide decks. Um, but in seriousness, uh, this is the uh, initial thoughts of the design team that was formed since the last ITF. Uh, to be clear, this is uh, an update. This is not like the final result and the final recommendations, but we wanted to give a status update on what we were thinking. I think we've made a lot of progress. I'd say in about the past month, we've met uh, four or five times. And the other names up here are the people who've been participating in that discussion. So let's talk about what we're trying to do. This is not everything about the document. Martin's gonna talk about some other things interesting about quick aware proxying later. But the scope of design for this particular um, design team is talking about the threat model for the forwarded mode proxying versus the standard connect UDP mode, which we're calling tunneled in the document. And we're trying to work on proposals for how we add encryption and then also analyze how these proposals and the, the standard forwarded mode that's currently in the document impact security and privacy properties and how they compare to the tunnel mode. Okay, so overall, here's a summary of what we've done so far. So we've talked a lot about the various passive and active attacks that you could have for both standard UDB proxying and forwarded mode. We've, um, and particularly Ben Schwartz, uh, has done a great job writing up a proposal for an extensible re-encryption model for forwarding. So this is like uh, a, a way you can specify when you're setting up the proxying, what type of re-encryption scheme you want to use. So we can define one now and potentially have new ones in the future. And then we propose one now, uh, which we're currently calling scramble. Uh, that is just encryption without adding any extra bytes. Okay. So let's go. And as we go along, uh, happy to have any clarifying questions, other discussion. Okay, so let's start out with the threat analysis. And um, I'm not gonna go into detail on everything that you're gonna see here on the slides, um, but this is gonna be some good background material. So first, our overall threat model that we're assuming is that we have an attacker whose goal is to break the privacy pro properties we're trying to get by doing connect UDP in the first place. And they're trying to learn what a particular client is trying to access. And because that, that's the conceptual goal when you come into like the, the reality of this, uh, it's equivalent to a attacker trying to learn the mapping between a connection ID that's seen on one side uh, for example, like the proxy to target path and a connection ID seen on another side, um, the client to proxy path. And these may be one-to-one -one mappings, many-to-one -one mappings, but we assume that if the attacker is able to uh, very assuredly correlate traffic from one side to the other, they have achieved their goal for the purposes of this general attack space. Okay. Uh, so, with the help particularly of Antoine, I wanna thank him a lot for the background he's brought from uh, 
other systems like Tor and the um, academic research that's gone on there, uh, we ran up a bunch and the overall categories of attackers that we want to distill down to are global passive attackers and global active attackers. Passive attacker being able to uh, observe traffic on both links and active attackers being able to inject or drop or copy or delay or somehow modify the traffic on one or both links. Um, and we found that it uh, essentially this analysis should cover kind of most of the cases based on the literature that's out there. Um, and so here are some examples of the typical approaches to performing these attacks that you have for Tor and other systems. Uh, you're trying to observe the packet metadata between both sides. You're trying to also uh, correlate traffic across this. Um, and as we'll find the, uh, the traffic correlation using timing or packet size is uh, much harder to protect against. And I, I think we found is somewhat orthogonal to our re-encryption problems because the, these problems largely exist whether or not you're doing forwarded or tunneled mode and they need other mitigations in order to protect against them. Okay, so let's go now through what we've done at least our initial pass on for how the passive and the active attacks apply to UDP proxying. Um, and I will appreciate if there are threats that you can think of that are worth mentioning that we've missed, please bring them up. Okay. So for the passive attacks, so just someone who is able to observe, uh, there are two main categories here. One is just recognizing the bytes in the packet of like, hey, I saw this entire packet on one side and look, the exact same packets on the other side or this connection ID is on one side and it's not on the other side or uh, the, the payload after the connection ID is on one side and it's also on the other side, any of those things, like you just recognize a pattern in the packet. Um, so the tunneled mode doesn't have this problem because you have your encrypted channel to the proxy and then you have your end-to-end -end encrypted channel that's being tunneled through that. Um, and the current forwarded mode, even though it swaps out connection IDs, isn't re-encrypting the full body and so you can recognize the body of the UDP payload after the connection ID. Um, there are also this these other attacks that are based on timing or size, as mentioned on the previous slides. Um, from our understanding, both uh, tunnel mode and forwarded mode are equally vulnerable to this at this point. It is possible to do mitigations for both of these with other techniques and extensions of adding padding, adding chaff, and lots of other things you could do. But that's not something we've specified or analyzed yet. Um, and is, is like another exercise separate from uh, the conversation we're having today. Alex. Um, Alex Schnahovsky, Google. Um, I'm not sure I 100% understand the claim that the existing RFC 9298 is inherently vulnerable to the timing or packet size one because isn't it the case that you can mul easily coalesce multiple packets together and send multiple datagrams in one physical packet when you're getting responses. Like, yes, I agree in one direction. There is necessarily going to be, well, actually, no, I should be able to do that in both directions. I agree that the naive implementation is obviously vulnerable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, right, the naive implementation, yes. And you need to go out of your way to do something to either coalesce packets or change the timing to quantize things or to add padding or add chaff. Um, and like, yes, in some cases you could coalesce packets. That's assuming that your datagrams are small enough, but also like you still have a timing problem. Like if I, you know, yes, I'm sending, I have two small ACK packets or something, they get coalesced. And now you see at a predictable timing, two packets that add up to the size. Like, there's a whole realm of analysis that can be done here on like what are actually viable ways to protect against these attacks. And I'm just saying like, it, it is not a solved problem of where we have like, oh, here's just the, 
check this box and now you are no longer yeah. going to be analyzed by passive attackers. Yeah. In this. I, I, I think that's true, but I guess the concern I have with this particular presentation is that I think that it does a useful thing of giving you a yes, no checkbox, but I think that a slightly more useful view might be to look at the gradations and also connect it to back to regular connect TCP. Because I think that the threat model here sort of changes as you're not threat model, the analysis of the threat model changes as you compare all of these technologies, because I think unless I'm mistaken, I think in the forwarded mode, right, the timing or size issue is a little bit more exacerbated without doing some of these mitigations and possibly changing the way we're going to specify this compared to what I think is true in the tunneled mode, because I think you have a little bit more flexibility in the way that we have formulated the connections. So like, I think that I think that the category is not just yes, no, is it vulnerable, but rather how much effort is it going to be to apply a mitigation? I, I, I agree that it's interesting to look at the effort to prevent these particular attacks. And I, I think it is the case, that it, like the naive approach in both cases, both have the problem. We can talk about obvious ways that you could try to solve the problem for the tunneled mode. Um, I don't think there's been analysis of like what would really solve it. And I, I think you know, while the approach for forwarded mode to solve the problem may be different, uh, th there still are approaches that apply there as well. Yeah, yeah, I'm not- just I'm... need to be written down. Like they, the approaches to solve that need to be written down for both because both of them by default would not be yeah, no, no disagreement there. I, okay. I merely was trying to make the point, and, and I'm not sure if this is true or everyone agrees with this, but like the claim that I'm making based on my understanding of this problem is that I believe more effort is going to be required on the forwarded mode. Um, and I think that that means that we need to spend that effort on both and make sure that we're getting sort of similar properties if we're even going to bother with this. I, so I, I think that's a, something for the design team or whoever else to go back on because I'm not, I'm not convinced that it is necessarily easier on one or the other. I think like they're both difficult, but there are some things that forwarded mode makes it easier to play with. Mia Kulivin, also part of the design team. Um, the point here is that we decided to not consider that in the design team, because as you just said, it's analysis we need to do for both and we decided not to do it yet. So if we want to do that analysis, then I think that's probably a separate design team. And I do agree, it might be easier to mitigate the problem in tunnel mode than in forwarding mode. But I also want to mention that this is like, then this is something that did, we did discuss. This is like one of the most used attacks against things like Tor or whatever. And these attacks are very sophisticated. So even if it seems like super easy to just add some padding or whatever, it's not that easy in both cases. Right. Uh, Martin Duke, linkability enthusiast. Um, uh, to, to just, I mean, having thought about this a lot in Quick LB, um, yeah. and I think you're alluding to this with the checkbox thing, but essentially there are no guarantees here. There's like a continuum where on the left end, there's one client connected to the proxy and you are linkable no matter what magic stuff you do. And at the, the, the right end of that continuum, um, there's like inf there are infinity clients and like even having very few countermeasures, like you're not very linkable. And the whole objective of this thing is just to move from the left end to the right end of that continuum. Yep. And that's kind of the best you can do, but it's all just a probability game. And and it's not like encryption where you are like safe or not safe. It's not a binary in that sense. Yep. And I think it's important to communicate that in that in this discussion and in, in security considerations when you write them. Yeah, exactly. And, and to be clear, the design team agrees that there needs to be a lot written in security and privacy considerations here, and none of that is written yet. We have slides. <laughs> hey, Colin. Colin Jones. I, I mean, this whole discussion always ends up this way, and for, the literature is filled with failed attempts to do this, but there's one, there's one point that's actually fairly solid, which is constant bit rate protocols achieve a certain level. So the question that I think would be interesting to ask on these is just simply a check mark. It's a yes, no, which is, you know, can we easily, is it, is it obvious how to do a constant bit rate version of X, right? Like that's, that gives you a simple design point near an end without doing any crap load of analysis and without trying to 
come to consensus on whether a given set of attacks, I mean, I totally agreed with Martin's characterizations of a spectrum and, and you know, it being very difficult. But we've seen time and time again, constant bit rate is generally a, a, a very solid point on that spectrum that's easy to understand and it's easy to ana analyze whether you can do it or not. Right, so I, I would ask maybe do that level of analysis of one of the checkboxes. Yeah, I think that's a good way to phrase it. Um, like, and in this case, my understanding is you could, you could, if you wanted to, absolutely do a constant bit rate with either approach. You would need to define some way to negotiate it to agree that the other side wants to do the constant bit rate or tell it to, but it should work the same for both. I don't know who's next in queue. It's me. Yeah, um, so also what we didn't look at in the design team, I think, is um, solutions that would add more bits to the packets because then you go into all kind of other MTU problems or whatever. So I think that was kind of also a little bit the scope. And I just want to mention in that sense, like if you if you go in that direction, then like the question is, what's the point where you just say, instead of using forwarding mode, I just like go back and use connect UDP because then I get like actually better properties. David Skenazi. To answer Alex's point, uh, part of the, the reason we kind of phrased this this way, and maybe like the, the check boxes wasn't the right way to do it, but our, what we realized in the design team is we were looking at specifically forwarding mode and the attacks on it. And a bunch of them were like, wait a minute, you can do that same attack on regular Connect UDP. And we had to draw that line and say, okay, if, if you can do that attack on Connect UDP, the regular one, 9298, unmodified, then there's no point for us to solve it here. Like the goal here is to develop a solution with a slightly weaker security model. But we were, we first, before we do that, we have to define the, the previous one. And so in particular, like, an attacker injecting packets on the target to proxy leg to the proxy that can control the sizes can do some traffic analysis on the other side, things like that. You're jumping ahead uh, of my slides. Then I will stop talking. <laughs> uh, yeah, me again, one thing. I, 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 I do also want to endorse kind of Alex's thought of just what is the diff between this and tunneled mode, which was also what your slide is. And one thing that strikes me is that um, padding is quite straightforward in tunneled mode and in proxy mode, um, unless you're going to load the target, which is probably not ideal. Um, we, I, I, we'll see what your scheme is, but you would need something kind of special to like toss padding and it will be thrown away at the proxy. Um, yes. So I, well, I'll, I'll, I guess wait for the rest right. of the slides. It, Thanks. It, and as, as we will get into the proposal that is still very early on from Ben, like would allow essentially negotiating what you're doing for your encryption. And so like you could have a version that says, you know, I don't want extra padding or like I do need extra padding. And like you agree on that. Like we've talked briefly about it. It's not like all fully fleshed out, but it, if you're negotiating this anyway, you could say like also add random padding using this algorithm. Yeah, I actually, I don't want to design at the mic, but I think padding with UDP options is actually super easy. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, okay, let's, I think we're draining the queue now. Um, one other thing, I'll just, just to explain on the slides. All right. You go have your chat. Um, Mira's last word was easy. Ah, yes, yes. Okay, um, so the the mappings, so this is just like a difference, and it's not clear to us if it's like a necessarily good or bad thing, but one difference is that generally when you're in tunneled mode, the client path is gonna have one or relatively fewer connection IDs, and the forwarded path may have more if you're talking to many different targets. And if you're doing forwarded mode, there is a more one-to-one -one correlation, although that is not necessarily the case. So like there is going to be different correlation between connection IDs seen on both sides between the two different schemes. Unclear in all cases, like whether or not that's a good or bad thing. Also for cases where we're doing just like multi-hop proxies, it's probably just one connection anyway. And so it doesn't make a difference. We just wanted to point that out. Okay. Um, so. I won't go into all the details here, but 
uh, Ben has written up a PR, which you can see there, PR 87, that's uh, sketching out this scrambled encryption mode. It's essentially uh, just a way to scramble all the bytes, change the CID, um, and then be able to decrypt it on the other side. Um, the key that's used to encrypt to any given peer is sent across within the uh, request between the client and the proxy. Um, so it's fairly straightforward. Uh, it should work for pretty much all quick versions. Like uh, it, it requires a certain, uh, I think like 16 bytes of entropy in the middle that's gonna get. Uh, if you had some quick schemes that didn't have that long of like a tag size or other randomness, then you would have to come up with a different uh, model for this. But the proposal is that you you would have a way to say what are all the different uh, re-encryption schemes you would support. And so if someone ever invents a quick version that doesn't have that much randomness in it, um, you could adjust for that. So uh, go read that. I won't go into the details more unless people have very specific questions there. Okay, so the goal of that was to just say like, hey, for that first one where we definitely had a clear regression, let's fix that. And we think that this does a good job of fixing that. Um, and we can go into separately the stuff we were talking about before about how you would be able to add padding or other types of things. Okay, so now we get into active attacks and these are super fun. Um, so this is listing the main ones we thought of. Um, so just to quickly go through these, uh, there are a couple, there, there are several mainly on the client to proxy leg that are problematic. And then a category that's on the proxy to target leg. So uh, there are a couple different ones that only forwarded mode is vulnerable to. So, and that, that's because it's not doing authentication or replay checks, uh, unless you, have, to do authentication or replay checks, you would need to add bits to the packet. Um, so an attacker could inject a packet from the client to proxy with a CID that it's watched go on that path and be able to recognize it based on timing or size coming out the other end. Um, and so that is something that an arbitrary attacker with normal tunnel mode couldn't do because it wouldn't pass the um, integrity checks there. An attacker also could just take a packet it observes and like replay a bunch of it. So I could say like, you know, I'm gonna see your packet, I'll just send it 10 times. That of course would not work with normal quick, um, but it, the, the forwarder, if it's naive, would just pass that through. You could add a basic like, obvious anti-replay mechanism into the forwarder logic to say like, I just saw this packet, I'm not gonna send it again, but that requires much more state on that thing, so. Eh. However, there are also attacks that do apply to tunnel mode. Um, you can corrupt some of the packets um, and then see kind of like in the stream of packets where you are seeing drops. So like if I'm observing a lot of traffic going by from many different clients on both legs and then I want to say, okay, I'm gonna attack this one client to try to identify which flow is on the other side. I corrupt the packets that are being sent by it and observe which ones don't come out the other side. So like which ones don't match the timing pattern. Um, and now like which CID is dropping packets on the other side. And now I've identified the correlation between your two CIDs. So that's actually a case that only exists in tunnel mode and doesn't exist in forwarded mode because the forwarded mode is naively passing it through. So uh, the, the active attacker that's capable of attacking on this link uh, can equally attack both and get the same correlation. And then both of these are vulnerable to the other direction because there is nothing that the proxy does to really check the packets that are going from target to client. So you can just inject whatever you want there and recognize timing, or you can drop whatever you want there and recognize timing. You can add burst of exactly this size packet and recognize them on the other side. So if you are an active attacker, from what we see, you can do the correlation no matter if you're doing forwarding or not. We also discussed some like 
congestion based attacks where you can like add congestion and see who reacts based on different things. But that gets very complicated. I'm not going to go into that right now. And there's papers on Tor you can read if you want to read that. OK. So that's bleak for active attacks. Um, so based on that analysis, uh, we are inclined not to try to do very complex things to try to make um, forwarded mode look like tunneled mode in terms of these checkboxes. Um, one could imagine, and we did talk about for a while, like, OK, you could have scramble with like some really short authentication tag and some like very short like replay counter to prevent the obvious attacks without expanding the packet size too much. But it's not really helping uh, against an, an actual active attacker. Um, so it adds a lot of complexity. It's just getting it to be more and more like quick, and you're just reinventing the wheel and adding complexity. And we don't think that's the right thing to do. Um, so, and, and to some degree, uh, if, if people are worried about the difference between those attacks of someone dropping packets versus adding or replaying packets, like packets, if you have a scenario where one is possible and the other isn't for some reason, um, maybe that determines whether or not you choose one mode or the other, but it's not clear to us that there's like a, a, a obvious definition of like, oh yeah, an active attacker wouldn't be able to drop packets, but they are only able to inject in certain ways. Alex. Alex Chernofsky. Um One of the things that I think might be a useful framing, because I do agree with your conclusion, yeah. is to compare it to what the status quo would be, which is a completely non-tunneled connection. Because I think a lot of these things look very bleak only until you compare it to a non-tunneled connection, right? At the end of the day, the question for this whole mode is what additional properties is it getting you over the baseline? And the baseline is not necessarily just connect UDP tunneled mode. It's, it's not having this thing at all. And the evaluation function is the difficulty that we have imposed upon an adversary to extract this information. Right, like the type of active attack that you're talking about here is you're talking about an adversary who has the ability to observe traffic on one side of the proxy, possibly both sides of the proxy, and to manipulate the connection. And they're very powerful. That's that's a very powerful threat model. And like I want to make sure that while we are acknowledging that the amount of effort it would take to mitigate one of these attacks is high, it still has substantially raised the bar to you can plug in your ethernet cable into someone's network and completely mess with something, for example. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think when we are finishing up the text for this, um, I would suggest we look at the framing against the true baseline of not having this feature at all, not just against tunneling, because I think it will help better set what capabilities we are getting and what trade-offs it produces. Thank you. Um, I also appreciate that you are predicting our future slides as well. So thanks for that. <laughs> uh, Martin Duke, Google. Um, two things. First of all, I agree that like the authentication tag thing is just pointless, not just because it's, it's complicated, but because you cannot impose any requirements on the target. And actually, I think the target is packets coming from the target are in many ways more dangerous or pretending to come from the target. Uh, in response to Alex's point, um, what I think is different from just having a normal quick connection is that there is a proxy that in practice is going to impose a potentially some congestion control limits, but also flow control and like proxy buffer limits on the flow. And there's like some potential for DOS attacks that, um, that essentially just steal somebody's capacity to interact with a proxy in that sense. Now that's also true in connect UDP because you can just, you can inject, like you can spoof the target and like fill up the channel. Yep. Um, so that's not a diff from connect UDP, but it is sort of a threat to deal with. That, that's, that's unique to having mask versus connecting directly to the target. Okay, I think we've turned the queue. All right, uh, what do I have next? I think this is the last one, yeah. So. I actually really like how Alex phrased it, so maybe that's a better way to put the whole thing. But I wanted to end on like 
what are we protecting against? Or like, what are we actually comparing to? Um, and I, I think this is important when we're looking at all of these in general. And I, I think, you know, with Scramble, we're actually able to get to more or less the right parity modulo mechanisms for allowing padding and chaff and other uh, timing uh, correlation attack prevention. However, it's useful in all of this to look at what is the correlation tech actually getting you. So in cases where you are trying to use connected UDP in like a one hop scenario and the client and the target they're going to are very sensitive of like, I am a particular user and this is my entire browsing history. Uh, like that's a very sensitive thing. And if you get correlation of that, uh, you have honed a lot of information. Um, now you also have to contend with the fact that that one proxy hop also has visibility into this whole thing. And so it's a very vulnerable place so that if you just get it to log what it does, now you have a lot of correlation. However, in cases when you have multi-hop proxies and essentially the target is just another proxy hop, um, especially one that's like kind of like the generic second hop for something, uh, the correlation tech also isn't exposing all that much. Um, and so I, I think it, it, it's important and we don't want to uh, minimize that. However, like in those cases, you're really just learning another hop to look at to go and try to attack. Um, you haven't necessarily learned anything about what the user activity is. It, it gets much more into like the full Tor analysis. Um, and another point here is that, you know, the one of the most powerful attackers here is kind of like the next top attacker itself because it is able to inject whatever it wants. So like if that attacker as the, the second hop wants to observe traffic on the other side, it could do a lot of correlation attacks. Um, so just things that all need to go into security privacy considerations for all of this when we're thinking about it and what deployment models are appropriate. Because um, I think that's ultimately where a lot of the, the privacy comes from is what parties are you having involved in this? How protected are your links? What are the relationships between the parties and the trust model there? Okay, that's all we had. I think this has been useful input. Um, please let us know if you think any of the directions we're going in or the conclusions we're coming to so far are really out of whack. So far, it seems like the main thing we want to do is add more discussion of how you would mitigate, like not the full mitigation for timing attacks, but the, the knobs that would let you do the equivalent <laughs> things to what you could do with tunneled mode when you're in this port. Um, now we have a queue. Tianjin. Uh, Kenji, uh, China Mobile here. Uh, have you, when you are designing, uh, this is a highly uh, safe uh, protection protocol, have you ever considered some lightweight protocol? Because uh, for, for some part of your proxy, you may have uh, like a controlled domain. Like for example, uh, in the wireless side, that is the, uh, the, the access. And then it's a fully controlled and they're our territory but we run the proxy, the connected UDP proxy mm -hmm. and the egress router, we call the UPF for 5G. And then beyond it is uncontrolled. So both ways, like you initiate your connected UDP from inside toward outside or vice versa. Have you considered this type of lightweight? So you're saying uh, removing the overhead of the re-encryption there? Um, or... I don't know, it's just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, your you know, design here. Because uh, uh, in in the scenario we have the real uh, requirement, because for the run uh, and uh, for the access, basically from the client to proxy is within the control of the domain. So we have full control. There's no uh, listeners or attacker right. from that side. But the beyond it, or uh, who knows? So have you when you are design, have you give some like a recommendation for this type of a light or one way only? You know. So. I'm not sure if I'm fully understanding the question, but what I will say is this, like the overall point of the quick aware forwarding mode is to allow the proxies work to be uh, more lightweight, to have to do less processing, have less overhead, both of packet size and processing. 
Um, and as it stands, the current definition that's not doing full re-encryption really like allows you to, like you just have like a quick handshake to your NAT and then you have a NAT. And like, so it's extremely lightweight. So I, I think the point of doing quickware is to be very lightweight. What we're trying to do here is protect against passive correlation attacks by adding some scrambling re-encryption. One of the open questions, which we didn't get into in this deck is within this negotiation mechanism where you could say, yes, I want to scramble or I want to do scramble V2. Do you also allow people to essentially just say like the null encryption and just like do what is currently defined in the draft and say, I'm like, this isn't actually all that privacy sensitive. I'm just trying to route through a NAT. And you know, the next hop is just like, I don't care who sees that. And so I think for your use case, potentially that's an argument then to allow that. And then it would be up to both client and proxy agreeing on that and agreeing that, yes, I don't think this is sensitive. I am okay just forwarding these packets and allowing correlations because I either I don't think there is an attacker or more likely, uh, there is no information to be gained by correlating this. I'm just going through the proxy so I can get the benefit of proxy. Okay, sure, thank you. Yes. So, uh, no chair hat, just speaking as a participant. Um, some thoughts, like in the Tor community, um, you know, there's a long history of looking at this as you, you referenced. Absolutely. I think global is maybe a little strong, like Tor in general doesn't, even Tor will not help you against a global, even passive adversary. Mm. But quite often, you're interested in an attacker who is willing to go to the time and investment to say sit between the proxies on that middle hop and then sit near a target and then try and do these kind of tagging and passive correlation attacks. And there I think you know a slightly more granular analysis would probably pick up quite a few more details that are important. Maybe you don't want to go that far, but then it's good to say, you know, we're not going to go beyond this point of protection um, for what you consider. And then on the solution side, there's like a gazillion academic proposals that are kind of stronger than AES counter, you know, that give you not quite authenticated encryption. They don't blow up um, like the, the ciphertext size, but they will provide stronger protection against kind of tagging attacks and stuff. I don't think anyone has ever shipped them, but it would be good to, you know, say, we looked at these and they don't work for reason X, Y, Z, um, just, to, just to be able to That's tie good. it off in a bit. I, I also think another solution rather than saying, we look at these they don't work is we we don't know if they work yet but here is the mechanism where once you define it you just slot it in here instead yeah absolutely yeah great point yeah hey. could have been again just on this point so i'm happy we should, could do that work but we should do it then for forwarding and connect udp because it's for both relevant and we didn't do it yet so i think it's actually a separate point um I just wanted to come back about um, your comment uh, where the baseline is, and we discussed this last time. And so basically the forwarding mode is somewhere between just plain quick and connect UDP. And I think what we try to do in the design team is two things. One, find the right point in between that we want to choose. And the other one is also um, this type describing the difference between those two things. So if you want certain properties or you have a certain deployment scenario, you can actually pick the right thing. Yeah, that's the next step. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my my mic was on mute. Uh, to answer Denis' comments, uh, I would be delighted to have a pointer to the work that you mentioned about the encryption protection made in Tor, because I think it would be candidate for alternative to the scramble mode that uh, Ben has uh, designed as part of the design team work. And uh, it, we could consider, we can consider it as an alternative for scrambling. So if you have a specific reference in mind, I would be really happy to read that and see how it can apply here. Sure, that's, uh, that's actually in Zulip now. Great, okay, I think that's it then. Martin, do you want to do your loopy sure. loops? Uh, do you want me to? Yeah, can you follow slides? my slides, yep. please? Uh, Martin Duke, um, I, I have spent uh, probably far too much time thinking about a completely different class of attack, which is based on the idea that in really any of the Connect Star protocols, um, the client has the ability to dictate its own routing through the network by chaining proxies together. 
Um, for a while, I was focused on the very like straightforward attack of making a path that like cycles through the same proxies 200 times, 300 times, um, and just creating the amplification effect. Um, TLDR, uh, it is somewhat more vulnerable than Connect UDP. Quick proxy is somewhat more vulnerable than Connect UDP to that, but actually no worse than Connect TCP. At least I've convinced myself of that. I I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of time talking about that because I don't want to be up here forever, but feel free to like, we can talk about this afternoon if you would like. Um, but actually in thinking about this, I did stumble on something else, which I think is fixable, but we have to make a design trade off somewhere. And uh, I'm certainly, I, I have no strong opinion of what, how we resolve this. Next slide. Okay, so this is a, um, a path that a client could dictate that includes the same proxy twice. Um, whether or not this is like a good thing or not is maybe orthogonal because a, a core like uh, uh, value of mask is that uh, you don't know that a target is a mask proxy. And so there's no way for, um, there's no way for these chain proxies to realize that they are in fact just connecting to a quick proxy as a target. Um, so uh, with, with the way that the, the CID scheme currently works in the draft, um, so the client will open a chain of, of, of uh, mass connections through these proxies and you, know, you set it up using tunnel mode, then you convert to forwarded mode. But uh, at the end of the day, what is going to happen, uh, not the, at, at, once everything's all set up, um, the client will have, have uh, advertised CID zero to the target as its client connection ID. It will then inform via capsule, it will inform P3 that it wants CID, incoming CID zero uh, from the target to be translated to CID one, because uh, as written currently, the client controls both connection IDs, although it can be rejected due to duplication at the, at the, at the proxy, it should presumably be rare. Um, and then, uh, so it knows that uh, CID one is gonna come out of P3 in the client direction. And so it tells P1 uh, to look for CID one and translate it to CID two. Um, I guess I have the arrows backwards on this chart, sorry. <laughs> but um, anyway, and so on. So basically CID zero is re rewritten to CID one, is rewritten to CID two, is re rewritten to CID three, and then finally rewritten to CID four and arrives at the client. So this is completely legal, completely fine. Uh, I don't know if anyone is bothered by this, but like to me, no problem. Next slide. Sorry. Okay, so now I'm a, uh, a uh, for a, a malicious client. Um, and what I'm going to do here is as I go through this, the, the reason this is numbered zero to four is because that's the order in which they're they are dictated. So uh, when I'm telling P2 what to do, uh, instead of telling it, oh, like when, I, when you see CID, CID2, send CID3, which is what P1 is looking for. Instead, I'm gonna say, uh, instead send it out of CID1. Um, and so, I. I think if you think about it for a minute, you'll see that when, when P2 sends a packet to P1 um, with CID1, P1 may misinterpret that as arriving from P3 uh, based if it's looking solely at the CID. Next slide. So there's an obvious mitigation here at P1 to actually look at the source IP address. So the attacker's countermeasure to that is to pick a P2 and P3 that are actually part of the same VIP. So it's some sort of load balance thing. So they come from the same target IP address. And so you, so P1 is no way to disambiguate the packets from P2 and the packets from P3. Uh, and in fact, we'll misinterpret the packets from, from P2 as being from P3. And so we will continually loop in this uh, P3, P, uh, rather P2, P1, P2, P1, P2, P1 loop. And of course you could make that loop arbitrary long if you want. And this will actually go around infinitely because as it stands, quick proxy does not have any sort of TTL decrement. Um, okay, so are there any clarification questions about the attack here? Okay, next slide. Oh, yes, Tom. The queue wasn't working. So, right, if, if P2 and P3 are like actually the same proxy. Yes. On the same IP, then they would recognize the conflict. That's correct. 
Um, but oh, instead, or, or, or put another way, P2 will not allow the issuance of CID1 a second time for its right. egress. Yeah. Right, but instead, so there, there, there are two different boxes running behind the same VIP. Yes. That are being load balanced. Yes. Okay. And when the client has made the request to P1 for both cases, right? Because it's made two different requests to P1 through this like nested chain. Yes. How is it identifying? I guess, is it asking to do a connect by IP? Not by like, does the client have a notion of these things being different? Like, are they different proxy names that I like? Am I like, what I'm asking P1 to connect to P2 and P3. Yes. Um, so, so P1 needs to either be the same device or alternatively a, like a, a pool of devices that have a relatively- well, It needs uh, have, to, have it needs low, to low share a target facing socket here. Like it needs to be doing socket sharing. Like, so I, I'm trying to figure out like, yeah. you know, what, what is convincing P1 to have the same socket to both P2 and P3, like it, it needs to think from P1's perspective, they are identical in every way. And it has yes. no idea that they are different things. That's correct. So I mean, okay, so the client in this case is doing all of its connects like by IP It is saying like, I want you to go to that particular IP. Cause like if it had two different names or. Well, I mean, it could be a domain like if P2 oh, I, okay. and P3 share a domain that resolves okay. to the same IP address. Okay, so, so it also, right, this also can just be reduced to from the client's perspective and from everyone's perspective, P, as far as anyone knows, P2 and P3 are the same thing. They just happen to be behind a load balancer Yes. and do not coordinate. So like I've deployed, sure. okay. And in fact, one mitigation that I so uh, forgot to put this. in the slide that will come down later is that if P2 and P3 share all of their connection ID state, uh, that is a mitigation for this. It doesn't sound super practical or scalable to me, but that is something right. we, could, we could force, we could mandate uh, right. as, a, as a way out of this. Okay. Um, thank you for reminding me of that, David. Just to, when Tommy was saying, don't do this, like this isn't a case of, you know, doctor, it hurts when I poke myself in the eye. The like way our quick servers are deployed and I'm sure a lot of others are, is this uh, load balancer and then other servers. And you can't have all of these servers constantly share state about every connection. That's just way too much traffic, way too much shared memory. So they coordinate in terms of their connection ID scheme with quick LB, all that. They have coordination. They agree on some things, but they can't, like I, I thought about this attack specifically, they would need to share every CID that they know with all of the proxies in the same load balancer domain. And that's just way too much traffic going around. Like that's not practical. And you would in fact need P3 to send to share a CID one with P2 faster than the client can, can configure this chain of, of stuff, which I, I mean, I haven't, I haven't like timed it out or whatever, but I'm skeptical, but global state can be exchanged that correctly. So, so Lars Eggert, a casual mask observer. So looking at the slide, I don't know if I'm in routing area or uh, where I am because so, so we're, we're rediscovering all the problems that we rediscovered over 30 years of trying, you know, tunnels for quick fixes over the internet and then we generalize and then this happens, right? So, so I'm sad about this, right? But, but it's every time we do this, right? Stuff gets really, really complicated when you try to have arbitrary topologies and I, nobody has solved this in the ITF, but it's always getting this complex, right? Um, I mean, this, this exact slide could be an SRV6 slide. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding, so, right? Am I turning basket <laughs> SRV6? That's, it's, that's it's, you know, loops me. and routing, and it's hard. I mean, to have state, and yeah. will there be a mask routing protocol at some point? Okay, so so I'm, I'm sort of sad that we are, we are trying to generalize it so, so much so, that we have these problems. I kind of wish that mask would have stayed at the simpler level. So, so the happy news is there's a solution to this, but, but I, I would like to um, turn around Lars's uh, thing to just kind of make the call, of act, call to action of people. So this is like one person who's a transport 89 security guy or a routing guy uh, that, um, that kind of spent a few hours and they figured this out. So there, there might be other stuff around here. And I would really encourage those of you who are security experts or security curious to like 
think about it a little bit on a white, with a whiteboard because it is um, interesting. And I'm, I would like to feel better that this was the only one. Ted. Uh, Ted, Ted Harding, whiteboard enthusiast. And I, I, I got up because I kind of disagree with Lars, right? There is actually a whole bunch of mitigation work that's been done as we've gone through this same poop, so to speak, uh, multiple times. And the most common of them is actually having something in there that you can decrement. It doesn't have to be a TTL, yeah. but if you introduce anything uh, that you decrement, then you uh, can determine uh, exactly how many passes through the loop you're willing to go um, by setting the value for uh, the, 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 the top of that decrementing counter. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems relatively obvious that we will immediately need to tread that ground here and then go and borrow all of the other things which have been done uh, to keep. So, 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 the, so, so, the, so the queue's building. Uh, I, I did ask for clarification questions about the attack. Uh, I do have some mitigation slides. Certainly I may have missed some, but it, unless people have other questions about how this works, can we move on? Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so there's some, there's some do you have a clarification question yeah, here? I do. So, um, you said this is a theoretical scenario, but I really have problems to like see when that ever would happen. Like, yeah, the, the, this, no. this is a malicious client, not something. That no, no, that I understand, but it's. No one has ever said anything like. Okay. <laughs> well, talk, talk. So. So P2 and P3 is something that I think will, will happen. The P2, P3 is a shared BIP thing. I, I will almost guarantee it will happen in Google's network, if nowhere else. <laughs> the, the P1 thing does require either like a single proxy is not load balanced or a load balancer with very poor entropy, which um, you know maybe we're all going to do a great job with our load balancer entropy, but maybe not. Um, anyway, next slide. OK, so, so there's some um, things that uh, I, I, I've kind of labeled them as non-remedies. Some of them can mitigate, uh, but they're certainly not cures for this. I, again, uh, as I mentioned in the other talk, encryption authentication, at first I was like, oh, that solves it. But no, it doesn't, because this is, these are packaged from the target. And again, we cannot change anything the target does. We cannot make the target add an authentication tag that violates all the requirements of MASP. Um, uh, Controlling the target facing CCID is not relevant to uh, allowing the proxy to control the, the client facing connect, the client connection ID from the target doesn't actually, I mean, if you kind of work it out, doesn't actually change the logic here at all. Um, and then lastly, TTL documenting, it does mitigate it. I don't want to dismiss it, um, but it doesn't really solve it. It's not super satisfactory to have it go 255 times. It's much better than infinity. Just set the, the, the top of the counter lower. Set it to 30 the way IT does. Pick whatever you like. OK. Um, so that is something we could do. Uh, I mean, it's, I certainly agree there's probably some, we can put a cap. I, I, I'm not disturbed by putting a cap on how many proxy haps we can, we can have if we find a way to enforce it. David Skenazi. Uh, IP enthusiast. Um, no, so what caused the infinite loop here was that we, the, the, the naive way of implementing this, or, or sorry, the logical way to implement this is, you know, in user space with sockets. And if you read from a socket to, for a packet here and write it there, you've lost the, the hop count or the TTL for, at the IP layer. Um, but if you look at this and think about it in a different way, this is a gnat with a little bit of magic, a gnat that twiddles the quick stuff on top of the IP and uh, UDP stuff. Uh, and a gnat respects the IP TTL field. It doesn't reset it because then you would have similar problems. And so as much as at first I was like, oh, it's not a great solution, but it, it does work to just make sure that when you, you know, read from one side, set the socket option to say, hey, give me the TTL as I'm reading it, propagate it as you do your work, and then write it the same number minus one on the other side. And that kind of solves this. So like, we don't need a new TTL field. We have them right there in the packet, but maybe we need to say, if you're on a platform that doesn't give you access to this socket option, like then you're not allowed to implement this because hilarity might ensue. Well, th there are other solutions. Next slide, please. 
Um, this is just what I was able to come up with. Um, so if we just have one socket per connect request, which is what happens in connect TCP and connect, uh, connect UDP, then this problem goes away because P1's connections to P2 and P3 will be distinguishable by the ports. Um, like that is that is a this, like being able to reuse these sockets is like a thing in the abstract as like a benefit of doing this. But if it's not an import benefit, we can just fix this problem. Uh, you could give the proxy the control over the virtual client connection IDs. So this is the one coming out of the proxy. Uh, I think David made like a like a principled argument against this, but I think practically it would work at least for this particular attack. And this is again why I would encourage other people to think about these sorts of loops. Um, we could eliminate virtual client connection IDs, which has a linkability thing, but that would be an option. Uh, we could, uh, somebody I think mentioned, we could force the use of server for an address if you're load balanced, because that would mean that the proxies would have uh, distinct IP addresses and not have this bit business. And maybe there's some others that we have. I mean, certainly setting a much shorter TTL than what is normal would, would solve this problem. And uh, that's all I got. So I think any, I'd be interested in any comments about like, what is the least painful, least compromising way to get through this problem? And that's all my slides. So I'll just open this up for discussion. I don't have a strong opinion on how we solve this <clears throat> personally. Tommy, Polly, Apple. Um, I'm leaning towards some flavor of the TTL type fix. Um, I mean, just going through some of these, I think eliminating the virtual co connection IDs like makes the correlation problem yeah. like the opposite of what we've yeah. just been talking about. So I think that's a regression we don't want to take. Um, and yeah, I think it's very problematic to give the proxy the control over the client connection IDs. I think the particularly weird thing that makes the client do is like it starts out with a connection ID it tells the server about and then immediate, like, immediately has to change connection IDs to the target, which besides being kind of like an extra dance, because like it's it's getting its inbound connection ID now from the proxy. And so normally, like one with with connect UDP, you're able to do like a fast open. So you're you've you've generated your quick packet to the target before you've ever heard anything back from the proxy. Well well wait a minute. So okay. there is a no, I don't, I don't think you're thinking about this correctly. So obviously okay. it's a negotiated in tunnel mode. So yes, you have a client connection ID that has been already negotiated to the target via tunnel mode. Right. And then you send the capsule to the proxy saying, here is the connection ID you should expect to see from the target. Which, oh, it's the virtual connect, right, client which, connection right, ID. Which, see, which, see, which, see, which, see, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. which the proxy can reject, in which case you can't use tunnel mode until, uh, you can't use pro forwarding mode until you resolve the conflict, right, by changing. But yes, so I the see. first time you see the virtual connection ID is when you ask for it and it could be rejected from the target. And you can't go to forwarded mode until that's all resolved anyway. So it, it, would, it, it would not, like you can't, Like un until, un until you get the okay message or whatever it is, you can't go to tunnel mode because you don't know what connection IDs to use. And so, right. So, so part of it is just like a principled thing of now you're receiving on a connection ID that you didn't determine. Yeah. But I guess also I, I need to think it through because like the order, if you're doing this many hops of like, when do you tell, because like you have to tell that virtual client connection ID that you got from this proxy to the next proxy that's going to be receiving on it for its mapping. Yes. And so like, it makes you a little bit more lockstep, I think, than of how you do it. Anyway, so yeah. I, I think maybe a solution would be like, do the TTL thing. And if you can't do the TTL thing, like don't let, sh don't let you share sockets. It's like if you detect that the TTLs aren't working, then turn Yeah, I mean, off. that would work. Um... Like, I don't know, if you hold a gun to my head and force me to, to select one, I, I think like eliminate VCC, uh, make the proxy just allocate a VCC ID is, is like, seems to be least, least painful. But um, like I said, I leave it to the authors and to the community. Ted. Uh, Ted Hardy. Uh, actually, I came to the same conclusion as Tommy. My, my reference would be, uh, one socket per connect request should be recommended uh, as good practice. 
and the TTL should be decrementing should be required. And then I think you get uh, a little bit of suspenders and belt there, which is very similar to what he said. Okay. Um, Kazuo. Uh, Kazuo, so I'm not actually sure if uh, TTL works here because it has a privacy concern. I mean, we were previously dis uh, saying that every bit has to be scrambled because they become a privacy concern in the previous uh, presentation. Then we are saying that there would be a creative sphere that's being decremented for each pop. So <laughs> it creates a correlation vector that we are trying to eliminate. All right, I'm uh, way out of time, way over time. We so, are way um, out of time. Uh, like, I, 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 I know waiting for that email was kind of horrible. So like, hopefully this is kind of publicized the problem and we can discuss on the list or on the GitHub and just find whatever solution works best for all of our use cases. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. I think we have Abby next. All right, hello everyone. My name is Zabi Singh and today I'll be presenting the Mask Connect UDB listener. So uh, I'm not gonna go through the whole mechanism of why we need it, but effectively what it is, is, is it allows you to use, uh, to connect to multiple targets over the same connection. Um, with traditional Connect UDP, you would have to do a connection per target. And also this enables you the ability to listen from um, other targets that the client ha hasn't necessarily specified. Um, so how it works is we create this field um, in, in the request header, uh, the connect UDP listen field. And, um, and so uh, as you see here, we, we add the IP version, IP address and UDP port in the in each quick frame to indicate where we want to uh, send the packet. And, and so here, uh, those I, uh, the IPN port information from the client to the proxy, it's, um, it's the target, uh, target IPN port. And from the proxy to the client, um, it's, it's the source IPN port that's trying to connect to the client. And so, so I do have a question there. If we want to validate the source packets on the on the proxy, so I do want to spend this session mostly discussing uh, discussing some open issues and what uh, what things we want in particular from this uh, from this draft. I'll go over the first one, which is. We discussed this the last time, which is let's change the name. Um, and I, the, here, here's a few that I saw on the mailing list. And like, because it's doing binding, it makes sense to have something like connect you to be binding. Personally, I'm, uh, I'm in favor of connect you to be binding, but if people have thoughts on uh, other names, please do let us know. And we do have a, an open issue on GitHub where you can uh, participate in the discussion, but also here. Um, how would people, for, for now, but how would people think about, uh, what would people think about ConnectDB binding extension as, uh, as an option? Uh, Alex? Uh, Alex Schnahowski, Google. I'm actually confused why people want to rename this because the way I'm looking at it is that this is more analogous to the listen syscall than the bind syscall, unless I'm completely mistaken. So in that case, I feel like bind is the worst name. Um, certainly it's not the worst name on here. I think mirroring proxy is the one that I absolutely would say does not make sense. <laughs> but I think my preference is to leave the name alone because uh, I feel like the others don't correctly convey the class of capability that you are getting here. Like to me, bind sounds like you're selecting an egress IP import on regular connect UDP, not the ability to receive incoming packets, which I think is the more interesting feature we get. 
Debe. Uh, David Skenazi, bike shed enthusiast. Um, so I, I don't have a strong opinion on this because like names matter a little bit, but not that much. Um, question for the chairs: Do we does the Meet Echo tool support multiple options, or is it just binary? Because uh, I only used it for binary in my sessions. Yes, no, no opinion. Ah, damn it. it, would, it yeah, no, no, it would just be great to have a quick show of hands and then pick one and then we move on with our lives because, like, uh, I, I, I guess all I'm saying is can the chairs help us resolve this quickly? And if anyone has a strong opinion, then why? It's a name. <laughs> Tommy. Tommy, Polly, Apple. I don't think a bike shed here is the good use of the working group's time. So I don't think we should vote on it here. I, let's just move on. Like, if you have an opinion, go on the issue. It's not time sensitive. Doesn't really matter. I think what you have is fine. The one thing I would comment is when we are thinking about naming overall, well, while we are talking about UDP here, there is connect TCP and one could very reasonably have a listen mode of TCP through the proxy in the same way. So I probably care more about consistency and being able to have the similar approach for both. And so something that sounds correct in both TCP and UDP is preferable, which I think is kind of listen, but whatever. All right, so I'll actually move on to the next issue. If people have um, thoughts on this, of course, uh, um, the mailing list or um, the, the, the issue mentioned there, please, um, I encourage people to interact with us there. So the second one is allow, allowing the proxy to send the public IP and port to the client. So once the client uh, connects uh, to the proxy, uh, the proxy should give its uh, public IP and port to the client. And this is you know, useful in several protocols for the client as well. Uh, such as WebRTC. Um, so right now the uh, proposition I had was we create a response header, which is just proxy public address. And David did mention that it, it could be more than more than one IP and port. So perhaps uh, this could be a list of IP IP and ports in the header response. And another issue that uh, I was um, told of is do we want the ability uh, do we want the, uh, the proxy to be able to allow, uh, pro have midstream changes so if uh, the server wants to migrate to a different IPN port if so we would need perhaps some sort of a capsule uh, to, to communicate this uh, Tommy So I, I, I like the general idea of giving the client information about what it got. Um, and potentially, potentially we could even put this in like the proxy status header as right. like one of the parameters of like, hey, like I, I'm telling you what your, instead of telling you what your remote IP and port are, I will tell you what your local one is. Like that seems like a place that we already have. Um, now it's not part of this, but it's a header that you can get back in the response. Um, so we don't necessarily need a new response header given that we already have proxy status. Um, so that's one comment. The other one for like the list and particularly the midstream changes seem very concerning. If I am a client of this, I absolutely do not want you to change my local port that I'm sending from because that is very weird. Um, like if, if I am sending and receiving to a given peer, at least my assumption here is that I have been allocated a port on this proxy and it's not going to like randomly between one packet and the next packet switch what port I'm sending to because that there's, I have no idea how that's going to like actually work with the other side. Right. Now I, I can see like, I need to jump in. sure. Sorry, David Skenazi, jumping in to clarify as co-author. 
I think, yeah, the intent here, and correct me if I'm wrong, so from what I said, this was having a list of IPs in case you have multiple IPs, but it could be a single port. Um, nice. So if you suggested to change that, yes. I'd yes. say, yeah, let's just do that because you're, you're totally right. right. So I, I'm very concerned about multiple ports. So if you have it one port, cool. For the IPs, I, I get why, like, you know, similar to how on a POSIX system, I can, like, bind to a port but still have it work for both v4 and v6 yes, that's yes, great that's, so please support that yeah but maybe we want some limits on like you get one v4 address and one v6 uh, like not not necessarily but like it, it, it would be good to have some determinism or understanding then like if it's going to be random like if i have like a whole slash 64 that i've been allocated here now I start wanting to know on every packet which source address That's I have. Right. And That's right. like, so you need to make the entire scheme more complicated. If it's just one V4, one V6, then we don't need to change anything because I assume that I get the V4 address when I'm using V4 and the V6 when I'm using V6. So we need to make a choice here. Otherwise it changes the entire scheme. What? Say. Um, so Tommy just made the point that if you have multiple v6 addresses, like if you have a whole range, you might want to know which IP it came in on. I think that matters even for v4, v6, because if we're doing UDP, you might need to know the MTU size, and you're going to have a smaller MTU on v6. Well, no. So the the the, the capsule here, it's like the datagram format rather, contains in it the IP version as the very first field. So anytime I'm sending or receiving, I know what that is, and so that disambiguates it. Yeah, I do agree on perhaps a single IP uh, v4 and v6. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I think that sh should be uh, good. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Magnus Westland. Oh, this was hot. Um, <laughs> I, I don't understand why you need to actually get multiple addresses. If you need multiple addresses, do more requests to set up more ports. It's that simple, isn't it? Yes. yes. And more addresses too. Oh yeah. So, so to clarify, my intention was to uh, do exactly what Tommy mentioned. Mm. Uh, so I think an, an IPv4 and IPv6 could be a specification we could ha add in there. Yeah, but even that is, I mean, okay, if it's very simple, otherwise it's probably as easy for the client to just ask for, I need one to v4, I want to v6. As long as it knows that they are available. That's, I guess, is the information problem. Uh, but uh, yeah. Just like, I I may want to be able to have a V4 and a V6 on the same port. And since there's not a requested port here, I just get allocated a dynamic port. It feels like allowing me to have one of each on the same port is convenient. Okay, yep. But yeah, I mean, this is clear that you should send, provide the address back to the client. Otherwise, they're just gonna do stun or something to figure, figure it out anyway. So it yeah. doesn't matter. Do you have anything else, David, to add? Uh, okay. Um, this one is exactly what I'm looking for uh, for the control domain uh, toward the uncontrolled domain part. Because uh, here, if you look at the connected UDP proxy part, and if you uh, initiate from your client side in the control domain to the proxy and to the outside. But now the things like what I'm looking for right now, uh, there are some real requirement from the 3GPP side, from the other, well, there are multiple things people are considering, considering right now. And then the initiate, well, well, I may propose this one, that the initiator is from the uncontrolled, the client in the outside. So it has been bothering me how the proxy node may expose its uh, proxy IP, proxy port to the uncontrolled side. But now, since you are giving some solution here. Right. Thank you. OK, great. Um, so we have Tommy. Tommy Jensen, Microsoft. Yeah. So I agree with what's been said about having a single port would be much better um, yes. and probably scoping down the IP addresses as well. I don't think we actually need to support having IPv6 prefixes, because I agree you could set up a new connection for each. But it might be worth having some consideration text to say that this draft is aware of some of the prefix allocation work going on elsewhere and why we're not supporting it here. Okay, yeah, I think that's valid. 
All right, so I'll um, move on to the, the next issue here. Um, so yeah, this has been debated for a while now, but uh, a lot, allowing, uh, re restricting accessible IPs. So for us, like at least me and David are leaning towards uh, by default, I'll, letting all traffic through and adding a, a security consideration that oh, the, the client is going to receive uh, all the traffic that's going to be received at that IP and port on the proxy. And I think it kind of makes sense because we're trying to replicate the, the listen function of, uh, um, of a UDP port, which kind of does the same thing. You have to deal with that. Um, I have seen some people say, oh, maybe allow client to specify um, IPs and IP ranges. Um, are, um, are, do people have any like strong opinions in favor of that? I do think if there is a need for that, perhaps it could be a separate extension. Uh, OK, so Jonathan. Yeah, Jonathan Lennox. I mean, I do worry that these mask list, uh, listeners that support this mode are going to be a very tempting target for griefers to just sp spam with huge amounts of packets across the whole port range in hopes of getting something interesting through or just, you know, but so I'm, I think some sort of uh, blocking or even, I don't know if that would be allow deny list or allow list or what you want, but some sort of blocking I think will, will probably be necessary. Mm, okay. Um, yeah, go ahead, Tommy. So I know you haven't gone on to the compression slide yet, yes. but I want to bring it up because I, the way that seems to be going is that we would have like, I think what capsule negotiation yes. of, Hey, there are different things that are special. It's like, Hey, I'm aware of this other remote IP in port and I want to make it special and put it on context ID foo. It's one way to block is to potentially say like, I am aware of this remote IP import and I want it to be dropped. It's essentially just a convenient way to get the proxy to drop instead of sending it all the way to the client to avoid doing work. So may maybe as we are designing those capsules, you could sure. solve this problem at the same time. Sure. Um, so my thinking was uh, there by default, we enable all and then if the client wants to be say i just want this range of ips to be allowed we create something like that it, uh, and perhaps we could uh add that to that capsule protocol that we were thinking of um i will move on to that before uh, mike so if the if the client wants an allow list functionality once it knows the remote IP address, it seems like maybe there should be a way to hand off to a separate connect UDP, although you don't have port number control. But like that's thinking analogously to syscalls, like you can get a separate socket off of your listen. Yes. Um, but yeah, I, allowing everything and passing it feels like an attractive nuisance because then attackers can just throw large amounts of traffic between the client and the proxy and you can't really do anything about it. But a, a way to say, I really am talking to this client or to, and to this incoming connection, so maintain that and drop these that I don't care about as I see them. That feels like the right balance. I don't know that it has to be in this draft. It could be an extension, but I also suspect anyone who implements this draft is going to want that extension. So maybe worth going ahead and doing it in one document. Sure. Uh, David? But I wanted to say, um, like these denial, you know, denial service attacks, there's, I don't know how prevalent it'll be to just send large amounts of traffic to the proxy and then all it'll do is send them to the 
one point like that that doesn't do much because you could just do the same work by sending that directly to to the to the client Um, so having a very elaborate way to prevent that which would then require a nice like thing to allow any real traffic would be very difficult but i think the the idea of oh you know what this one ip is sending me garbage please block that one sounds like maybe the right middle ground so i'm in agreement with uh, folks here Okay, yeah, having a block list instead of an LL list, that's also an option, I think. Um. So I have a comment that I was going to leave to the one on compression, but then Mike Bishop essentially brought up the conversation about closing the main listening and say like, hey, I have the people I want to talk to. I don't want to get anything more. And this is a, a problem that I, I raised the issue recently yeah. on already. And so, you know, that suggestion was kind of, I think what Mike was saying of like, okay, you know, we have our main listen UDP. Can I peel off a connect UDP that shares its port? And I, I agree with the comments on there that like, Hey, we have this compression thing where we can just have capsules negotiate different context IDs for that. And I think that is cleaner. However, the one problem that leaves me with, because I've, you know, I've been trying to implement this over this week. And one of the things that at least our APIs allow, and I also sockets do allow. So if you're bridging sockets into this, you have this problem is that like I can have, you know, like a listener on UDP or like a bound socket. I can then create more specific connected sockets or for us like connections off of the listener. And then I can leave those open and close the listener. So like, that is something that is expressible today that I can say, I don't want to receive anything else. I, I'm going to close this port except for these things that are now open. So one way to solve that would be in addition to what I suggested earlier of a capsule that allows me to say, you know, just black hole this one other address. If I think I'm under attack, maybe more interesting is to say, I've established these particular uh, compression flows where I have acknowledged these specific peers on these specific ports and addresses. And now I want to close the context that I use for arbitrary packets. And once I do that, now I can express something equivalent to what I can express today in sockets. And so it's a very clean API mapping. Uh, Go for it, David. David Skenazi jumping in as no, oh, I'm in the queue. Wow. <laughs> See, there. Ta-da. Um, sorry. Um, I mean, I, I look, kind of love that we're designing the protocol in the mic line here. Um, but with the PR that Abi has that we're eventually going to get to that next slide, um, if, we, if we eventually add a way to say, okay, close that compression context, you could just say that and say that close the main one. And that, that's exactly yes, that. Exactly. So all that kind of just works. If right. you let me close the main one, then it's great. Yeah, I okay. I, I think we designed, we landed on a good design. I'm quite happy. <laughs> Go ahead, Kurtej. Hey, Kurtej from Apple. Um, so the example use case you mentioned was WebRTC. And today WebRTC uses turn for something like this. And there are ca- actually two steps involved. There is an alloc and then a bind. And then alloc means just give me an IP and port that I can send to someone. And bind is where you you kind of match them. And after that is only when like packets start flowing. Right. So it's not like a open listen where I can receive any arbitrary uh, packets from anyone. So it right. basically, uh, it prevents this problem where someone can like spam you with packets. Right. So is, are there other use cases you're envisioning for this, which are non web RTC, which care about like receiving arbitrary user UDP packets, which you've not talked about here. Um, not per se, but if someone wants to use the tunnel as a server, perhaps, right, and for, get everything forwarded to them, that's a desirable case for them. Okay, so that's like a non-web RTC, some future yes, use case. exactly. Okay, sounds good. The other thing I wanted to like respond to David, uh, where you uh, mentioned that, you know, a user, like someone can just spam a user anyways, um, even if they didn't have this. I guess like that's what like uh, the NAT will prevent you, right? You have to like punch a hole through the net for someone to send something to you. Yes. But this is giving you like a 
so it's not the same i feel like this is opening up like a new attack yeah. okay thank you okay so i'll move on to the next feature request. just in terms of timing we need to be pretty pretty fast here and we need to take any discussion okay. to the list okay yeah so um one uh the thing uh tommy was alluded alluding to uh it's uh, we, since we're sending IP and port in every single packet, uh, that does add some overhead, and we can we can simply just compress away with uh, with context ID, which is already a field that we're provided through Connect UDP. Um, here, I'll show you. Um, so the the client can send a capsule that says, "Oh, here's the context ID that that I'm gonna register, and this is the IP and port." Uh, so anything, so the, uh, then the proxy acknowledges it. And then from here on, the client and pro uh, proxy can send each other data while omitting the IP and port information from every single data grant. Uh, so that's uh, kind of uh, the proposition, the PR request I have. I have the PR linked in the slides. Um, so feel free to comment on that if people have any strong opinions on this. Um, And I guess that's it. Um, that's, that's all the open PRs we have. We, if there are other things that you would like us to consider, please, uh, through the ma mailing list and also through our GitHub, uh, I encourage people to interact with us. OK, great. Thank you so much, Abby. Right, thank you. Okay. Uh, next up we have Alandra. Yep. Uh, do you want me to do the slides? No. Okay. Yeah. You know what can I do this? It was uh, thinking when it talked so much about the problem. So yeah, sure. Uh, okay, in that case we've just got them, so let me take them back. Um <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you might need to reject it unless I can figure out how to kick you out. Sorry. Yeah, apparently. There's no, the, the, I know where the button usually is, but. <laughs> yeah, we're just, we're just stuck here. <laughs> Would you rather us share and then you can control, or? Sorry. So I'm 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 logged in as chat, um, and so is Eric, and neither of us can take back. There we go. There we go. We're in business. Thanks, folks. So I'm uh, back again with uh, Connect Ethernet. Um, not really much on this slide. Next slide. I think Eric is driving here. Yeah. All right. Um, so it's kind of adopted. Uh, we still need to finish rechartering. Uh, so assuming all that goes well, uh, Connect Ethernet has been adopted by the working group. I'm excited. Thank you. Uh, next slide. Uh, so while I was doing some revisions and talking to some folks, uh, I'm trying to limit the scope of the draft to basically make it like a patch cable. It's not going to be implementing the full features of, say, an Ethernet switch. That should be delegated somewhere else. Uh, if your server wants to implement that, cool. If it wants to delegate it to, like, some other piece of software, that's fine. Uh, but I don't think it needs to be in the protocol itself for how to send the frames across. Um, and that means like we don't have to worry about how multicast works. You'll just send those frames and something else can deal with multicast groups and whatnot. Uh, next frame, or slide. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've already heard some interest from some folks. Uh, 
on this list. Uh, if anyone wants to tell us a bit about uh, what they want to do with it, uh, we could expand our motivation section and uh, make the draft a bit stronger, uh, either here or on list. It would be awesome. I'll give you all a moment. Not a walk. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to actually answer your Martin Duke, uh, AD. I, I um, not answer your question. I just want to take this opportunity to have what I think is an important disclaimer, which is that we are rechartering uh, to. Okay. Well, um, that, yeah. All right. Fair enough. Uh, well, anyway, so I do want to, like, I don't think this is a bad use of working group time, but uh, I, I do want to caution people that this work is still provisional on the charter being, uh, the recharter being adopted. Yep. Thanks. Okay, Chair, uh, this is Jahed. I am not able to get into the queue, so if I'm on site, yeah. So something for the uh, tech tips. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Nokia is interested in it. And I think uh, the use case there is basically we have an 3GPP, um, we have this ATSS use case where we would like to also connect um, the, in the way it is. The draft is talking about, about connecting as an Ethernet line. Uh, so it, it, it makes, um, if it is okay, I think uh, this draft actually need any strong motivation section. Even if I'm saying like we're interested in, I think we should actually really be writing why we are doing it. Um, and ATS, this could be one use case, you can describe your use case, but this draft really need good motivation to go get it done. Yeah, agreed. Um, Lars, I got as somebody who works for a storage winner, I want to connect fiber channel. Uh, so that was a bad joke, but, um, <laughs> you know, uh, so, so, but in all seriousness, uh, since we're slicing and dicing what Ethernet means here by eliminating broadcast and multicast, has anybody asked 802 if they're cool with that? Because the IETF is typically very upset if another SDO starts saying, well, we use SRV6, but we're not really going to pay attention to the deployment considerations that the IETF has set for it. Right? So it's, it, the answer might well be this is cool, but we should definitely ask 802 if this is a, an acceptable cherry picking of the ethernet standards. Yeah, I'm not saying we're dropping multicast or broadcast. I'm saying that we'll carry those frames, but yeah. like your patch cable does not care if it's carrying a multicast or broadcast packet. Like that will be delegated to right. something that's speaking 802. So maybe then don't call it ethernet. So ask, ask 802 is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Connect layer two is also another option for this draft. <laughs> So Jahed, uh, again, I cannot be in the queue. Uh, so I think this is a good, good, good point. Uh, and I actually think we should put it in this coordination call we have uh, with IEEE. So then, then basically you have some um, feedback, direct feedback on it, because this has popped up. So I'm going to jump the queue to just say, um, yeah, like, so there was a discussion on whether the current charter had like enough weasel words to do this work. Um, and the reason I wanted to recharter was to have external review and, and like formally request all these other the Ethernet stakeholders to have their say about this. And whether I don't object to the coordination call, but like charter would be recharting as a formal process to do that. Corey Fairhurst, um, maybe you've all said it, but I mean, this has been done in Interior many times and there were pitfalls. Um, we could just learn. So rechartering might actually bring an interior AD in to have a look at this mm -hmm. and involve IEEE. Uh, Tommy Jensen, Microsoft. Seeing as how we got into the questions anyway, because I saw I have a question slide, but here we go. Um, if this is intended to be like a patch cable, and the security sections currently talks about the risk of an attacker sending arbitrary source MAC addresses and trying to imitate devices. Assuming that Ethernet standards owners are okay with it as we define a subset, is it not reasonable to have a way for the client to inform the server what its 
one MAC address should be outside of the special ones like the all zeros used for other protocols such that an unexpected other device MAC address could be treated as a protocol error? That may be reasonable for a like point to network or point to point connection, though you can also be bridging two networks. So you might not have just the one MAC address. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, in that case, such a thing should be possible. Oh, that was you. Yeah. <laughs> Alex. Um, Alex Nohowski, Google. Um, one of the things I want to quickly focus on here is that I think the analogy here with where this capability falls on the spectrum of link cable to switch to router is sort of what we get to choose from the working group's perspective, right? And we're seeing the same thing as we saw with Connect UDP and Connect IP and now with the name debated Connect UDP listen draft. Like we have analogies in each of these capabilities to some, some existing capability, right? Whether it's a syscall or a flow or a connection or what have you, right? So we need to basically decide where along the spectrum we want our capability to start and end and what the security considerations for all these things are. Um, I think in this particular case, right, like I think there are some cases where you would want to do something straightforward and say, no, it's completely a link cable. There are no security considerations, but that will basically affect the playability. So sort of to Lars's point of like, you know, have we asked 802, where we need to sort of hit the balance of building something which does not trample on existing standards, but at the same time actually make something deployable. So when we talk about capabilities like Mac filtering or Mac address, masquerade and rewriting with EB tables, right? These are all capabilities that already exist in the outside world. The question is how much do we want to mandate as must be implemented to have something viable? So we should be looking at a lot of these things with that eye for both this draft and the others, because while we can totally do a kitchen sink, we can be in this working group for the next five years. I don't think we should. Let's build the minimum viable thing Let's figure out what our extension points are and make sure that we give ourselves enough rope going forward to build something useful. Um, Tommy Polly Apple. So bouncing off the earlier discussion for you know point to point versus point to network and network to network. Um, that is very, very similar to the conversation we had for Connect IP. Um, and there's a mechanism in there for like the limiting request scope, which is essentially like you can either choose to set it up as a wildcard in the request or to say, I only want one particular target. Um, so it feels like we should try to be parallel in mechanism there. So like, you know, that was essentially URI template variables you could fill out if you wanted having something similar here would be natural. Um, so it, it's nice when all of the, the mask family protocols uh, seem coherent together. To, to what you said earlier, Alex. So, so I'm, I'm, it's, it's cool that, you know, that we're convincing ourselves that we're using ethernet in a form that is kosher. It's not our call to make. It's, it's really 802's call to make, right? Similarly to how when the ITU decides that what they're doing with IP is kosher, it's really our call to say, yes, it is, or yes, it isn't, right? So, so um, I, I, I actually don't think we, don't get me wrong, I don't think we want to like do all of Ethernet here. All I'm saying is that the subset of Ethernet we're supporting here, they're okay with, and we can call it Ethernet, if that's what it, the term is we want to use. Uh, Yaroslav from Um One area that I think we should either um, leverage here or explicitly discourage is use this as a transport for EVPN. Um, EVPN traditionally has been using VXLAN or NVGRE, which are not authenticated. I think this could potentially be a strongly encrypted authenticated transport for data center interconnect, or if we don't want to do that, then probably we should explicitly state that this is not designed for that. Otherwise, it's a little bit confusing. We may as well jump to the next slide, although I think we've basically been there. 
get closer to the mic. Oh, um, yeah, can we? Oh, thank you. Um, so as far as what's next, besides all of the things we've just been talking about, um, like we also need more implementations. I have the one in Google Quiche. Uh, be nice to get some interop going. Um, next slide. And uh, yeah, any other questions? Magnus Westlund, um, how do we do with support of the full, full basic Ethernet frame size, 1518 at least, without v any VLAN tags? That, I mean, the reality of is that, I mean, to my understanding, to support Ethernet properly, we would need to be able to support uh, Ethernet frames of 1518 byte size. And unless you have an IP MTU of 1518 plus quick headers plus all the other things, you you can't transport it unless we have a fragmentation mechanism for connected Ethernet. So that's my real my question. How are you doing with fragmentation uh, and reassembly? Uh, right now, I have no plans for that. Um, it's possible that if you need that full MTU, you might need to be transporting this over something that has an even higher MTU to cover the extra space. I know that that's true of a bunch of like different uh, like internal networks for places. Um, over the internet, I've just uh, done stuff with a lower MTU because that's what you always get when you're tunneling things. Um, no. So l luckily here, like we have our datagram frame that uh, you know, as you know, has MTU limitations, but we also have our datagram capsule that doesn't. And so I, if the idea is that we need a way to support those longer frames, but in practice we won't use them, then we're golden because we have a way to send them. It's just that they'll be sent reliably. And if you decide to send all your packets like that, that'll have poor performance. But in terms of like it being correct, it will work. And so if you, the, the idea, and we definitely need some considerations in the document explaining that this virtual patch cable that we created, you should set its MTU so that it fits inside datagram frames instead of datagram capsules, but we're, we're there. No, no, so my point is saying like this patch cable that you're using, we're just, you can say like you're going to use it for something, right? You're probably going to run IP over it. Um, and if you're crazy IPv6, I don't know. Um, and like this is a consideration for whoever's building that stack. And if you, the packets will still get through, like we can send arbitrary length datagram capsules. Just to respond to that, I mean, back to my question. I think the question is, are we actually supporting Ethernet? Are we maintaining assumptions that Ethernet have, like ordering, delivered, etc., of the frames that arrives and things like that? I think we need to look a little bit and think, if, is this really Ethernet we're producing? And can we produce Ethernet? Um, Again, uh, this is not the first Ethernet tunneling potential technology. <laughs> VXLAN and a few others has been around for quite a while, and I think most of them decided not to bother with fragmentation or assembly, leave it to uh, upper layers to decide what to do with smaller MTU and adapt accordingly. I think before making these decisions, it would be good to look into what other protocols have been doing in this space and why. Sorry, I think that last term will come in mine as well. I'm fine. Oh, well, that drained faster than I expected. So if anyone else has more questions. I, just to the myriad of like, Let's just say, I don't know how much I don't know about Ethernet. And um, we 
definitely want to make sure we don't get into the pitfalls. And if the simple solution is to say, um, to not to change the name and say like, this is the, you know, a dot two dot one, I think, uh, Mac layer format, because that's what really what this is. Like we're saying that what's getting fer ferried across is six bytes, source address, six bytes destination, or the other way around. I never remember, you know, then that might make things easier. Because I agree that if we start really opening up, like what are all of the features of Ethernet, like for example, in order delivery. I don't know if Ethernet has in order delivery. I don't want to find out. Um, and uh, so maybe like reducing the scope there to we'll make it just as useful, but we'll make it less scary. We will definitely have to liaise. And Lars is coming at me. Oh, I'm scared. I'm running away. I'm running away. <laughs> You're asking to do a standard here, right? And, you know, cobbling something together that works in your deployment, fine, right? Go do it. But if you want to have a standard here, right? It's, it's, we can't just say, you know, we're going to slice it and dice it and, and ignore things like, you know, maybe we're not carrying full Ethernet frames if, if that's what 802 is actually requiring us to do, which we don't know yet. But I really encourage you, if you don't understand Ethernet really well, you probably want to get people on board right now that do, because otherwise we're going to be in a world of pain in this working group. And just to state, like, I'm not the author on this, so luckily I don't have to. Um, but to, like, and to the previous point, let's take a look at what the ITF has done in the past for things like L2TP, we have, or like GRE, like we have multiple ITF standards that have a way of carrying frames. And I think probably that's, we should do the same to avoid, um, like, so. Yeah, we, we will talk to 802. I don't think anyone has said don't talk to 802. I think we're all on the same page. And I think the next thing that we're about to talk about is the charter, which we'll talk about that. Uh, Tentori, I really think the idea of trying to limit the scope of this in a way that claims you're just using a specific frame type, but not otherwise meeting the expectations of Ethernet is probably not the right path forward. And I agree with everybody, talk to 802, talk to the int area where they've done this multiple times. But the reality is the people who will want to use this will come in with the expectations that they built up by using Ethernet full stop. And you know the number of people out there who buy products which are labeled frame type 802.1, uh, three or one without the rest of the stack is pretty small. I haven't checked our catalog to see whether Cisco sells anything of that type. <laughs> uh, and it's a pretty big catalog, so there might be. I could go investigate if people really care. Um, but I, I think strongly we, we, we should be meeting the expectations of the people who will want to use this as a transport for their Ethernet uh, uh, as a replacement for their patch cables. Let me put it that way. And if we're not doing at least as well as the patch cable, we should stop. Great, okay, thank you, Andrew. I think Eric is gonna talk a bit about the charter change now. All right, we also have a little bit more <laughs> charter discussion to continue much of what we are already talking about. <laughs> Eric, um, we can't hear you so well. So this is some current proposed text that we have. Um, it essentially adds this sentence talking about connect Ethernet. Um, it doesn't currently, one of the, the main things that I think is, is a task for the chairs right now is to organize, uh, making sure that we get the right eyeballs and the right kind of review on uh, this document, and some of that is, is going to be liaising with other standards organizations, some of that is going to be uh, having some nice chats with some of our friends in other IETF areas, and making sure that we can get uh, internal IETF eyeballs on this kind of thing. Um, so I think we've got a couple of minutes here. One of the things that I think we, we have as a, a action we need to take is to add um, add additional text in here, just like we have at the at the end of the charter for the other groups that we will coordinate with, uh, we need to extend that list a bit. Um, but if there's other feedback or, or other places that we should put something, um, now is a great time to discuss it briefly. We will then take all of that to the list and uh, formalize things there. Lars. Yeah, Lars Eckert. So I think the rechartering will need to wait until we've talked to 802. 
so that we know what to write here, if anything. Because it would be unfortunate if we charter, recharter now, talk to 802, figure out that it actually doesn't allow us to work on what we want to work on, and then we have to recharter again to take it out. Totally. Mars, um, do they not get external review, or does that not is that not satisfied? Okay, that's good to know. So we would we need to go to new. It goes to new work. Um, I don't know if they're looking at it. So I had made the right decision. It, it needs to go onto the coordination call, and and we can actually initiate one for this, right? So this does not necessarily mean it's a long delay, but I would like to stagger it out that way. I mean, that's actually my question, what you actually want, because just on the coordination call, you might also, I mean, this is not an authoritative call where people can just say, this is fine, you get thumbs up, right? So what are, if you look for something more formal, you have to send a liaison no, message, or I'm not sure we want that. Or like first step, I think, is actually just sending it to the coordination mailing, just, just making people aware about the return explicitly. Right, so we should, we should have a crisp description of what we want to work on, right? Which is probably a little bit more than the, the sentences here. No. The draft, is, I bet, is not understandable by eight or two. I mean, this is about HTTP and how we move stuff. It's yeah. nothing about how we deal with address families, whether we're doing LLC SNAP, whether, how we're going to deal with MAC addresses, which sub protocols we're involved, whether it's a bridging extension or whether it's a framing extension, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of things that eight or two understands that aren't in that draft. 802 is not a person, right? Somebody <laughs> has to read it. Exactly. And, yeah, so, and the people on the coordination list are the people that actually work in both organizations, so they know a little bit about the IETF as well. So I think the first step is to just send the draft there and then figure out if they have any comments or they need further feedback. So the, the comment, what, to what Gory said, the comment will be, you're not talking enough about the Ethernet specifics for us to answer the question you're asking us. And so either we can add those specifics into the draft or we can add those specifics in an email, but just, so, so we, what's we're- the, What's hmm? the question we're asking? Exactly what Gory said, sort of the, what type, how much can we limit ethernet for this use case and still call it ethernet? Is it okay to not carry full length frame or have an option for it? Is it okay to have no discussion of all these things that Gory talked about and can we still do it? I mean, think of it the other Thank way. Thank you. One other this thing, um, Corey, if you don't mind to... taking some of those, and, and it's not just you, we'll want to collect, but put some of that in GitHub. Yeah, I, I think we, we have a good path forward here, which is to start a conversation with them of like, hey, we're building a new way to carry Ethernet frames. Are you open to a conversation? Because we're not asking them to, you know, take the draft as is and put a stamp so we can publish it as RFC tomorrow. That's not what we're doing. Right now, all we're saying is, hey, are you open to a liaison relationship as we build this going forward? Or, or do you have some, like, crazy concern where you think we should absolutely not have a new way to carry Ethernet? And I think that should be solvable using our liaison and discussing that on the call, right? Uh, Alex Schnahowski, Google. I, I, I just went and looked at the RFC for GRE, which is 2784. And the only thing it says about Ethernet is that it reuses Ethertype. So I'm currently very confused. Right. So, so, so what I'm currently confused about is if we look at our existing IETF protocols, which allow you to deal with Ethernet-like things, we don't say much about ethernet but for some reason we're currently having a very in-depth discussion for this draft for doing approximately the same thing that has been done in routers for ages so i'm, I'm currently very confused why we've moved the bar and if i'm just missing some historical context i really would like someone to fill me in since we are at time before I think we go through and, and detail all of the answer to that, I, I think the, the point is very well taken, which is which is that we do want to make sure that we're doing this with with both knowledge of uh, advice from and the review of um, the, the relevant folks. So uh, we will we will certainly get coordinating on that and, and make sure we do that. And Alejandro, we will also work with you to help better articulate exactly what we are we are needing this for and doing with it. Yeah. 
uh, Jahed. Um, so I, I stand up because I wanted to just make sure like we have the next step right. So the I think what's the next step? Uh, we can do two things. We can work on the details on this, all the things that we have been discussing here on the draft and go for it. Or we can initiate the discussion saying like, hey, we are planning to do this and we need your help and um, reviews. And we are calling it the Ethernet, but we're actually going to target a very soft set of, uh, of it if it is the case. Um, and have the discussion uh, going on, and we can start with the coordination calls. So sending mail to the coordination master, Russ is right. Who is coordinating? Yeah, Russ is coordinating. So sending a mail to him with like planning what exactly we are we are doing here, and start to have the discussion there, and then see like where we go. Like like Lars has a very good point. Like we are calling it an Ethernet, whether it's, we can really call it an Ethernet with it, all the reduction and all this thing. But those, I think, I would like to hear from the IT politics guys and our routing experts to come and tell us rather than we try to figure out this thing. Last I go to the, to the point that Alex made. So I'm not saying we're moving the bar here, right? I'm, I'm very sure that um, that particular document and all other documents that we have that touch on ethernet have been liaised and discussed in the coordination call. What, when, when you say that particular document doesn't say anything other than the ether type is used by implication, that means it, you can stick any frame in there that is valid under 802, right? Which I don't think is the case here because we just talked about all the different things that we don't want to support, right? So this is a more limited format than what's there. So, well, let's figure it out. All right, we are okay, well over just... time. But yeah, we're we're yeah, over. So I, I think my takeaway here is that I'm going to like sit on this charter update for a little bit while we work out some of these issues, and then um, I'll talk with the ISG about what they want to see in the charter tech specifically beyond this, because um, I think a lot of these 802 details will not go in here necessarily. Um, but uh, I was hoping for November 30th for, for charter review for start the ISG process, but I don't think that's probably possible anymore because there's some, there's some meetings that have to happen first. So um, the bad news for the authors is like we're going to be in limbo for a little longer. <clears throat> yep. Thank you, Martin. And we will, uh, we, we will get coordinating on a, on a bunch of that. So, so keep an eye out for that as it comes. Um, but yes, I, I think your assessment that this will take a little bit longer is, is totally accurate and we will get there. With that, we are well over time. Thank you all. Um, extra thanks to Ted for taking excellent notes. Um, welcome Dennis as a fun new chair. Happy masking and enjoy the rest of your last day of ITF. Thanks everybody. Martin Gold.